So I'm going to go ahead and kick off. So good morning. Um, this is a recorded uh, webinar for the Global Entrepreneurship Week. We are kicking off today with a session, uh, a dialogue on global perspectives on how to advocate for improving global entrepreneurship networks. Um, at this, we'll have a great panel uh, of, of folks from different parts of the world to share their insights on how global entrepreneurship differs around the world. And so let me go ahead and begin the PowerPoint slide here for you. One moment, a little difficulty here. So good morning, my name is uh, Dr. Jeffrey Marizic. I am uh, the co-founder of the Global Urban Nomads um, and we are a nonprofit focused on developing leaders who develop leaders globally uh, in the social entrepreneurship net space. Um, we focus on three pillars, uh, social entrepreneurship, transformational leadership and intercultural competence. And so today we're hosting a conversation with you as part of Global Entrepreneurship Week. And so we thank you for uh, sharing your morning or evening, depending on what part of the world you are joining us. Um, let's go ahead and introduce our guests. Um, we have three leaders uh, from around the world. Uh, Mohammed Muse Hassan is uh, from Somalia and he is a leader at the Institute of Innovation, Technology and Entrepreneurship. And Jade Zhao is with College Leap and has also practiced entrepreneurship in China, and of course, Bryce Reich from Harness, who's leading the development of an entrepreneurship ecosystem platform. Um, I'd like to give each of them a moment to take some time to introduce themselves. So before we jump into the questions, uh, let me um, ask each of them to say a little bit about themselves, their background, and uh, how they are involved in uh, Global Entrepreneurship Week. So Mohammed, um, could you tell us a little about yourself and your organization and your role? Uh, thank you very much, Titor Jeff, and hello everyone, the panelists and everyone joining us from uh, around the world. And my name is Mohammed Hassan. I'm the director of the Institute of Innovation, Technology and Entrepreneurship. Uh, I'm from Somalia, uh, which I hope that you were not expecting to see some from Somalia joining here today as a panelist. And that's why we have the topic of global perspectives. Uh, uh, basically, I'm the director, I'm the co-founding director of the Institute, and what we basically do is we incubate uh, student startups, and we also target youth who are being exploited by uh, armed groups, so, so that we could prepare them as a business leaders instead of just uh, being exploited to fight against their country. So we've been in operation for the last two years, but we've been part of a university that was operating in Somali for the last 20 or uh, one year. So, yeah, so thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to having a great time with you guys. Well, we really appreciate your time and thank you so much for joining us. We are um, really excited to be able to actually have a global conversation this morning. So, Jay, I'd like to welcome you into the conversation. I know that you've been working with College Leap most recently, but you also have some global entrepreneurship experience in China. Do you do a little induction introduction and tell us about yourself your organization and your role sure thank you jeff for having me here so hello everyone my name is jay and uh, i'm initially from china so i started my first venture at rochester new york so then that venture got selected to the national science foundation icrop program then i I was a freshman when I started that. And then I dropped out of my university, went back to China, started another venture in China, worked on it for two and a half year. So during the time I worked on my company in China, I also started a nonprofit at Hong Kong, uh, China to, to, sub, to kind of improve the exchange, cultural exchange between US and China. And then I went back to the U.S. and started College Leap. So for College Leap, it's a nonprofit we founded to empower the community college international students. 
across the United States. So I'm the co-founder and I'm also in charge of all the program, like uh, organizational project we have prepared for all the community college students. Beautiful, thank you so much, Jay. And so last but not least, of course, is Bryce, who's leading up Harness and uh, both Mohammed and Jay are part of the Harness ecosystem. And so uh, Bryce, can you share, tell us more about yourself, Harness and your role? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jeff, for having us. And, and uh, it's always nice to see Mohammed and Jay. Um, yeah, so I am the co-founder and chief strategy officer over at Harness. Um, uh, we, me and my, one of my co-founders actually originally met in the, in the Navy. So we're both Navy veterans and uh, had a chance to live in Japan for four years. So really got to dig into a little bit more of uh, culture more in the Asian area and uh, just culture around the world. Um, and so we, we originally started Harness just to connect the ecosystem uh, of entrepreneurship, providing people the opportunity to leverage their, their individual ecosystem, but also connect them with uh, internal partners. So uh, like, like Jeff mentioned, we're partnered up with, uh, you know, Mohammed and Jay. So programs across the world. Um, and yeah, we, we're just excited to be here and we're excited to um, be able to help support the entrepreneur ecosystem um, one organization at a time. Thank you, Bryce. So today's format is a series of questions. We'll maintain a mute on all the audience till the end where we will open up the opportunity for some questions, comments, and dialogue. But we're gonna go through a series of prepared questions this morning uh, just to begin to have a conversation around uh, global entrepreneurship, and the cultural influences of working in a global setting. So the first question for uh, our panelists, and they can ask in any order, um, and I ask that each panelist respond with some response to these questions. So um, how does your organization support global entrepreneurship? So um, how does your organization support global entrepreneurship? Yeah. I can go first. Um, yeah, so our our organization, Harness, um, what we do is we provide a support and intelligence platform for engaging, tracking, and advancing innovation communities. So what we're really focused on is launching white-labeled solutions for organizations that are really trying to um, grow and expand their innovation community. Um, so we actually originally started at the universities because we saw those as hubs for entrepreneurship and hu hubs for um, people who are just change makers. Um, and so we had the chance to launch over within uh, UC Berkeley and, and a couple other schools in the UC system uh, and recognize that this isn't just a California college uh, level problem, but this is a global innovation ecosystem problem. So then we started working with um, uh, workforce development um, that are focused around innovation. Uh, we've worked with a couple of community colleges and now really pushing on um, the global aspect. So uh, we've been working with uh, Mohammed and, and uh, the Somalia ecosystem uh, a lot, trying to figure out how we can better support their, um, their uh, ecosystem and, and allow them to connect with uh, entrepreneurs that may have a, a inherent socioeconomic um, privilege that they may not have. Um, and that's how we're, we're supporting uh, the global entrepreneurship right now. Thank you very much, Bryce. Uh, the image on the screen is a picture of students who are participating in College Leap. So Jay, maybe you might be able to speak to uh, yeah. what you guys are doing. Yeah, sure. So at College Leap, we have around 25 countries represented. So that means like we have students from around 25 to 30 countries like working with us. So I think the way we are kind of support the global entrepreneurship is by providing them the platform and resources because there are a lot of very ambitious and brightest students, but they, they don't have any experience in entrepreneurship or they don't have any experience building something from scratch. So what we do with them is we regular, we host like regular meeting with each and every one of them. And then to, to kind of uh, know what they are trying to achieve. Then we will sit down with them and come up with 
with a action plan. So we tell them, according to our experience, what are the potential obstacles they, they will probably face and how they can maximize the, the value of their project. Then afterwards, they will just act on the action plan and try to achieve something. So I think that aspect is really important, like the resources platform and also experience because they, they are very capable, but they don't know how to get started. So we just uh, put them on the right track to, to get them started. That's how we kind of support the global entrepreneurship from our organization. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Mohammed, would you like to speak about how your organization supports mm -hmm. global entrepreneurship? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jay. Uh, basically, the way we approach and uh, the way we make our programs more international is we increase the exposure of our students to international programs. For example, one example was shared by Bryce, in which we are part of the Harness ecosystem. And in the ecosystem, what happens is our students get registered on the platform, and then they can get connected to all the other students in other universities who are part of the ecosystem. And then uh, the benefit of this is that the students do see the, 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 the ideas and the way the other students are doing their stuff in their part of the world, whereby uh, the way that we do things may be different. And then this, this kind of exposure increases the creativity of the students. And then it also kind of, of, of gives them a kind of ideas on how to approach of the startups. And, and sometimes, for example, when you have access to students in America, for example, the University of California, that you have access to a high level of, 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 of content, high level of uh, students who are uh, who has developed uh, enough knowledge of, of expertise in the startup uh, ecosystem, and this is this is really helping us as 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 like a hub a hub who is in in Somalia, whereby you don't have uh, like you can't get access to these high quality uh, programs. That's one way we do. Uh, like we give our students access to uh, global programs. And also what we do is we kind of collaborate with international organizations. Me, I am from Japan. I, I was educated in Japan. I have a master's degree in Japan. So we do collaborate with our university, especially the, the entrepreneurship program. And we have virtual programs whereby we have virtual startup competitions. and. We, our students do compete with students in Japan, students in Russia, and also in Slovenia. So, and then this again builds global leaders, not just leaders in Somalia. And we, uh, I also recently visited USA. I, I visited MIT and Harvard University, and I met with Amy Smith. Maybe you are familiar with her. And what Amy Smith does is she has programs for MIT students, and then they travel to Africa. They come to Tanzania, they come to Kenya and Uganda, and then they go to the rural parts of those countries, and then they see the social problems in Africa, and then take it, they take it back to MIT, and then they design programs, which we call appropriate technologies for, for our, our part of the world. Basically, we cannot just adapt to high-level technologies in, in, in America, because America is America, and we have Somalia here. We need appropriate technologies that can enable us to 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 like embrace those innovations in America. And what I have seen is so was so transformational. For example, one example was like I have seen students in MIT who came to Kenya, and they have seen that the African woman who lives in rural Africa it takes her more time to shell the corn. So. And then they, and it also, uh, her fingers are damaged during the process of shelling the cones. And then what they did was like, can we come up with a solution that will help her like shorten the duration of shelling the cones? And at the same time, will make her like avoid those damage on her fingers. And then they came up with an idea and that's, they are making a business out of it. And that's exactly what we need in, in our part of the world. We need low level technologies that can improve our social problems. Yeah, and this is the way we approach it and do uh, and prepare globally. Wow, Mama, you've got a lot of reach. You're doing a lot with a lot of different parts of the world, so that's amazing. Um, and I really like the tangible results that you shared with us. 
So let's go forward. Um, so then here's some other questions. So how does entrepreneurship differ globally? We can kind of unpack that a little bit. And also, how do we advocate for entrepreneurship in different countries and cultures? And I think, Mohammed, you were kind of speaking to that, just the, the low-level technologies was one example. So uh, maybe you could share a little bit more about how you um, might see how we advocate. And of course, this is a picture of yourself receiving an award for innovation. I want to be able to share a little bit. Yeah. More. Yeah, Jeff, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this is uh, actually this question is actually relevant to our context. Uh, what happens is like, let's just go back to the basis of entrepreneurship, right? Uh, we teach entrepreneurship as a concept whereby the students have to come up with a commercial viable startup idea and then they have to make money out of it. And then, then we go to the next level whereby we take social entrepreneurship and we mix the social impact with the business mindset so that you can have a sustainable business model. But then in our context in Somalia, you need to go a higher level than that. Uh, we use an entrepreneurship as a business, uh, as, as, as a business building tool. We're not just using it as, as, as a kind of building a businesses. And the reason why we use an entrepreneurship as a tool to build this is because of uh, our government is weak. They, we don't have, it, it, like the government doesn't have full control of the country. And the problem of what happens is that the youth get ex gets exploited uh, by those against the government. And then now uh, we have to take like the civic roles whereby we have to teach the youth to just be like a good citizens, not just go against the government. And we using the business, especially the entrepreneurship to, to, to kind of develop the skills whereby they are making money, but at the same time, they're rebuilding the country. One of the reasons why our youth gets exploited is because they need money. They need like the kind of survival, the money to survive basically. But then if you give them the skill so that they can end their own stuff, then they don't have a reason to join to armed groups and all of this stuff. Yeah, so basically this is like a level of entrepreneurship that we apply in here in Somalia, whereby we use it as a tool to build a peace in a country whereby the government doesn't have a full control of all the country, yeah. Thank you, Mohammed. That's very beautiful, right? The idea that entrepreneurship is actually a process of peace building and civic development. Uh, Jay, I'll, I'll pivot to you. I know that you had practiced in Hong Kong um, and now you're here in the U.S. and have seen the, um, the American capitalist view. Uh, how do they differ globally and how would you advocate for um, developing entrepreneurship in countries like China? Yeah, so I think for China, we, unlike what Muhammad just said, like the entrepreneurship that Somali needs a lot of like capital and all that. I think a Chinese market ha definitely has a lot of capital if you have a good enough uh, venture. So I think what, what they need the most is the, the high qualified connection. There's a way like we connect and network in China is totally different than the way we were doing it in the US. So in the US, we have, we have linking, we have all kinds of like, uh, like email address, you can send directly, you can send email directly to the people you want to make connection with. But in China, it doesn't, it's not work that way. So basically, you the people in the same level they stick to each other so they it's really hard for a entrepreneurs or like a newly new entrepreneurs to get connected to someone with a lot of resources with a lot of experience there's like very few ways you can make that happen so that's that's one thing i love about us right so you can always make the connections that are that that are beneficial with the people who have more experience who have more resources who have more capital than you but so I think one thing we, we really need to do for the Chinese entrepreneurs, especially the small, like the, the new entrepreneurs, is to provide them with the connections and the way how they can get tapped into the ecosystem or how they can get tapped into the higher level uh, connections. So that's, that's a very critical uh, element that's gonna play in their entrepreneurship journey. The other thing I would say is, uh, we need to kind of advocate for the mindset of taking risk. It's, uh, taking risk is now is like the standard or status quo at Silicon Valley. It's not the same for the majority part of China. So uh, people, uh, I think a lot of students, they 
they put like uh, I want a stable job as their as their career goal, but rather uh, there are there are some like lesson like courses, some programs to to teach you entrepreneurship skills. But I don't think they did a good job to to say you can take the risk. So maybe uh, advocate for risk taking behaviors is another thing. I feel like are currently lacking in China. So these are the two things I identify. But I have to say like after, I think it's 2015, after the policy, the Chinese government began to really support entrepreneur and entrepreneurship in China. There are a lot of programs, there are a lot of capital uh, flushing in that uh, like entrepreneurship area. So it's much better than before. So you have um, some things about networking that are a little different, but there is capital. It's just trying to get access to that capital can sometimes be challenging. Um, so Bryce, it seems like um, Harness has some solutions to these things, but what has your experience been um, as you've tried to venture out with your platform globally and, and seen different countries and cultures as you've tried to work for an e uh, an entrepreneurship ecosystem. Yeah, I think. Well, I think to to start off, like uh, you know, Jay and Muhammad both said something really similar, right? Is is the United States has an opportunity for entrepreneurship that other places around the world don't. Um, and I think you know, I think as entrepreneurs and innovators, even everybody on this call, they probably can already understand that that's present. But understanding that that's present doesn't mean that you understand how to help uh, not so much fix the problem, but uh, lessen the problem. Um, and so I think for, for us as a company, obviously we have a platform that allows Somalia, allows other people around the world to connect with these innovators, these entrepreneurs, these investors, these, this community in the United States. Um, but I think also even further to that, past just our platform alone and our and what we've built um, us as a team um, at harness we are you know we're full of you know uh, underdogs and people from around we're employee uh, our employee base isn't just from the United States our employee base is from the around the world as well um, and we've come together saying as entrepreneurs and innovators in the United States it's not only uh, you know, a privilege that we get to uh, support innovators around the world. It's almost necessary. Like this is our, this is our role as an innovator and entrepreneur in the United States, whether you're at idea stage, series A, B, C, D, public, you should be pushing to get tapped into other cultures around the world. Because I know, you know, I, obviously I know, I know Jay, I know uh, Muhammad, I've been able to meet a lot of other people around the world. And the number one thing they're lacking is resources and a good team that may be a little bit more, you know, educated or more willing to take risk. And us as you know, uh, entrepreneurs in the United States, we need to be able to give back and say, hey, I want to give you guys capital or I want to get you connected with the right people that may be able to invest in you and start bringing the United States capital, whether it's human capital or financial capital to those countries. We don't need to hoard it in the United States. And I think that's something that's really um, you know, important for you know, advocating for entrepreneurship in, in other countries. We can say all we want. Yeah, I really love uh, you know, seeing Africa or seeing Russia or seeing China um, have great startups. But until we actually put our boots on the ground and say, I'm going to invest in some way, whether it's getting them connected with capital financially or capital, human capital, um, I think all those are just words. <laughs> so we need to actually take action and do that. And I think that's something that Harness is really advocating for and something that we've been doing since day one by hiring on people who are immigrants, people from around the world, um, and now trying to get uh, a larger network, um, not only on our platform, but in our kind of Rolodex as well, so that we can start connecting um, people globally. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bryce. Yeah, I really appreciate what you said about the need to distribute capital um, 
human, um, fiscal, and intellectual capital around the world, it's really important that we um, open up markets and are able to move um, those forms of capital so that we can see growth in different parts of the world, new solutions. So the next question is coming up and it's, <clears throat> how do we share opportunities with other cultures, I'm sorry, other countries and cultures in entrepreneur uh, network building. And so Jay, I'm gonna ask you to take the lead on this. Um, how has College Leap and your work helped build entrepreneur networks? Yeah, so I think our entrepreneurship, like in our sense, is not that explicit. So we don't say like, hey, this is entrepreneurship, but we, we definitely advocate of the idea of making something happen or building something from scratch. So although we don't call it entrepreneurship, just to make that clear. So I think what we did with uh, like uh, sh uh, share opportunities with other country is more of share other, the opportunities with the students or people from different countries. Right? So we, as I mentioned before, we have 25 countries represented. So we, uh, I think it's just gonna be have some one-on-one -on -one conversations with all the students from different countries, trying to really understand what their mindset and what their culture and what are stopping them from being entrepreneurs. So that's, that's what we are doing right now. So we, we have meetings with uh, all of our leaders every like regularly. And then we help them to build a action plan according to our experience. So, so they, can, they can really leverage what the resources they have at different colleges to make something happen. That's what we're, we're practicing uh, at College Leap, I would say. Thanks, Jay. I really like what you say, where you're helping people learn to solve problems. You're not necessarily putting that entrepreneurship word out there, which could be intimidating at times, but really just trying to get the, the mindset and the thinking in your students as a beginning point for them to understanding what entrepreneurship is. <clears throat> yeah. So, Mohammed, um, I'd like to ask as well of you, um, what are some of the opportunities that you see for entrepreneurship network building? Yeah, Jeff, I do agree with Jay. And what we basically do is we make sure that we have different programs. And since we are like the hub, the main hub, we act as a resource of resources. Uh, we do look for resources available for our members and then we act as the resource so that they do get access to all these then and opportunities. And what we also do is we can like, like for example, uh, being part of the Hane system, we always look for ecosystems whereby we have different key players, uh, and, and 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 this is very important. Like for example, sometimes uh, the youth they 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 don't they don't just need training. Some some of them they are maybe they are already trained and they do have high level skills, but what they're looking for is access to finance, for example. And, they, for, and maybe they may also need access to government information. So in that case, you need to be a resource and then not just necessarily a training center. And this is what, what we basically do. We build ecosystem, we, build, uh, we bring players together, and, then, and this is what we are doing with the Harness ecosystem. What we are doing is we approaching the private sector, the big corporations, we asking them to register on the platform. We are approaching the government, we also asking them to join the platform. And the same goes for the hiring organizations. And why we all doing this is just for, for, for our entrepreneurs to have one stop shop so that they could get all, all their issues solved on the platform. And, and I also do agree with Bryce when he say like, we need to be very, very aggressive and uh, in terms of supporting uh, like uh, people in other parts of the world, those who need in, in support. Uh, like he said, in some countries, Funding is not an issue, but in other parts of the world, that's the main issue. For example, sometimes when we ask uh, international uh, guests to give uh, speeches in, uh, to our uh, youth, what they share is that funding is not like, don't think about funding at all, just focus on your business idea. And then what our students say is like, that's the only thing we focus on. We don't focus on ideas because like, we don't know where to get the money from. So, 
so I would understand when when people in other parts of the world say like don't talk about the funding, just focus on on the business idea. For them, that's not an issue, but for us, that's the main issue. Whatever you have, you need access to to those resources. So so we build a kind of ecosystem that brings all these issues and those opportunities together. We don't just give trainings to our members. We also give them access to finance, access to information and everything. And we also do have advocacy programs. Uh, when you are in an environment like Somalia, you need to act as the main, like the champion, the change maker. You need to show people what is possible. Uh, and they, like, for example, tomorrow we have an event whereby we are bringing the Minister of Commerce and, 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 and industry in Somalia. And the main issue that we want him to have in the event is to, sh sh like, we will have a panel whereby the, the, the owners of startups and uh, micro uh, businesses, they will share their challenges in front of the minister. And what we want him to hear is that the, the personal struggles and challenges of those that he's supposed to support. But then, then we will have him speak in front of them and make pledges. And by having those programs, we're building an advocacy program whereby we're building a complete ecosystem. So yeah, we don't just give training opportunities, we give a whole package of, of, of support. Thank you, Mohammed. Yeah, so you're showing that it really is a multi-dimensional approach. You've got to work with the government um, and really the urgency that there is in problem solving in Somalia where um, students want to engage in real world problems and solve real world solutions, not just academic drills. So I think it's, it's rich for opportunities for creating solutions. So um, Bryce, um, I'm gonna welcome you back in. Um, you know, how, how do you share with other countries and cultures and entrepreneurship network building? Obviously this is uh, some of the information that was on your website talking about harness as a tool uh, for building ecosystems and also uh, of an opportunity for people if they're interested to contact you and schedule a demo to learn more about how uh, this tool works. But maybe you can share in your own words. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, th there's a few things. So obviously Harness Platform, uh, we, we are a white labeled solution that allows uh, individual organizations around the world to um, keep their brand and credibility while still supporting their ecosystem internally and, and also getting them connected to uh, global entrepreneurs and innovators. But I think it even goes further than that. Um, the, the Harness, not only platform, but the company itself and what we do is that we understand that there are every single ecosystem, every single organization is so vastly different, even in the United States. Um, I had the awesome opportunity to just meet with program directors, uh, workforce development people, uh, people running innovation um, centers and nonprofits around the United States and around the world. And what we recognize is, yeah, everybody's so vastly different. And so we take it a little bit one step further, maybe even two steps further. And we look at it and saying, okay, well, here's our tool. Um, and this is, you know, we're providing this for you. But we take it to a point of saying, we also want to be as hands-on as possible because for two reasons, I want to learn everything I can about innovation ecosystems. I know maybe uh, uh, you know, a, a fraction of a percentage about innovation ecosystems around the world. Um, and that's with me literally talking to directors and program managers around the world all day for the last two years. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to come in and say, we don't want to change the way you're doing things. We just want to come by your um, already successful initiatives, not only with our platform, but with our team and start bringing other ideas that we've seen other organizations use and see if it can be implemented in your organization. Um, and so I think that's, that's what's huge for us too, is that, um, you know, there's a lot of platforms out there. There's a lot of networking things. There's a lot of resource sharing opportunities but there's nothing that's you know white labeled to keep your credibility um, out there, and there's also nothing that has the amount of support and the compassion and care that our team does. Um, you know, I, just alone with Muhammad, uh, I started working with him maybe eight months ago, and I, I think it just obviously it's been a great relationship. He's able to be on this this panel discussion, um, and 
I've had the awesome opportunity to be able to speak with, you know, 70 to 80, um, you know, youth entrepreneurs over there and share how Harness can just uh, come alongside them with um, not only the platform, but with the knowledge that we've gained. Similar to how I answered the last question is we want to take our intellectual property. We want to take our um, things that we've learned in our network and be able to share it with the world. And so, um, yes, we have a platform that helps with that, but we also have a team that is hands-on with that. Thank you, Bryce. Yeah, it's pretty amazing work that, um, that we can do now, especially with internet networking to where it is evolved, even the Zoom tool that we're using now, and more than ever, we're connected. So I really appreciate your leadership and, and really driving global entrepreneurship networks around the world. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, ask Mohammed to lead this question. Um, if you had a new entrepreneur mentee, and this is you, it looks like teaching at the, to a class at Samad, and how, how would you coach them and how would you navigate them through global entrepreneurship networks when maybe they think local, when they haven't yet kind of thought in a global perspective, how would you lead? Yeah, Jay. Yeah. Like, uh, I think I shared this point before, but let me say it again. Our, all our programs do have one component, which is exposure to international programs. And by being exposed to those international programs, we are building global leaders, global citizens, not just Somali leaders. And, and, and in this way, it also helps us, like this global mentality, helps us like easily persuade the youth to be strong leaders in their country and play an active role in the country. So we do have partnership with global different organizations. And then those different partnerships are helping our mentees to, to kind of grow quickly and grow in an efficient and effective manner. Like we said, we do have partnership with Harness platform. So all our new members who join us do get access to this platform and then they can get connected to experts in other parts of the world, students in other parts of the world. We do also have partnerships in Japan. We do also have partnership with, like for example, we have an official partnership with edX and Coursera. Like uh, we do support our uh, youth to do it like as a value added uh, business, we give them access to all the courses on, on, on Coursera and also on edX. So when, whenever they have issues to, personal issues to develop, like for example, they want to learn Python, they want to learn like leadership, they want to learn and how to start a startup, then they go to those courses and then whenever they are free through us, they can access to those global courses prepared by top elite universities. So yeah, by building global partnerships for our youth, then we can prepare the next global leaders in Somalia. Awesome. Um, Jay, how about you? Uh, College Leap, how does College Leap help you support mentees as they navigate the, the ecosystems, the networks? Yeah, so I think what we did firstly is to prepare them with a mindset to become a global entrepreneur. So entrepreneurship itself is a mindset, right? So we, we need to let them know you in order to build your network, you need to create value to everyone in your networks. And how can you maximize the value you create to the others while you, before you even request anything from them? So I think things like this are the centerpiece for the entrepreneurship. So we, I think from our conversation, we definitely educate them a lot on the mindset they should adopt in order to be a great entrepreneurs. And then the second thing is we ask them to use a lot of referrals. So we, we try to leverage our own network so that they can, so that we, when they want to, so for us, it's not global per se, but it's more like a national per se. So they, they have their own project and they want to expand this project to the organizational level, which is they want to expand it to all the national chapters we have. So when, when that happens, we will educate them on how to network and how to use a referral from our chapter leaders to get into other colleges and make that happen to in other different sites. And the third thing 
I would uh, emphasize is uh, the the mindset to deal with rejection. So that's that's a really a key part because when you try to expand your network, when you try to know someone new, it's totally normal to get rejected. And a lot of students, because they're they're the brightest students, they've been successful their whole life, right? So they are not able to deal with rejections. So that result in they are not willing to make some request right? so because they don't want to get rejected so so i think letting them realize that get rejected is totally normal and it's a good way for them to learn and to build network is is very very center to building the network and center to entrepreneurship that's a whole thanks jay so yeah um entrepreneurship is a mindset i also heard Mohammed mentioning that as a mentality. So it's a way of thinking and also about, like you mentioned, a tolerance for failure. Um, if you're trying to innovate, you're going to fail often. So you, it's really about becoming resilient to failure and, and really understand that failure is an opportunity to learn. So thanks for those remarks. Um, Bryce, um, tell me more about how you would support a mentee and how you would help them navigate networks. Uh, yeah, so I, I actually have the opportunity to have a, a few mentees right now. Um, and I, I think uh, it's, for me, I don't think I'm, I do it 100% the best way, maybe. <laughs> um, but the kind of the way that I, I look at it is saying, um, when it comes to network building is, yeah, don't have fear on being rejected. But I would want I push them to say, okay, go to cultures, go to countries, go to, go to places that you would never even think of working with and meet with 10 people. They could be in higher education. They could be in government. They could be students. They could be entrepreneurs. Just meet 10 people. Cause first off, you don't know, um, you know, you, you don't know what connections they may have in their area. But also, it gives you the opportunity to uh, get outside of your bubble. The United States, a lot of, a lot of, at least in the entrepreneurship world, and you know Silicon Valley, and um, you know I'm in Southern California. Even here, a lot of people are really siloed on what they know and and where they're trying to um, network, and they don't recognize that there's a whole entire world of amazing change makers that um you don't know so that's something that i i would say for our, my new mentees is is doing that um and the next thing i would say is look at everybody that they're human first and then they're their job or then they're their role then they're something else it doesn't matter your um you know your ethnicity where you're from uh your you know social structure of your country it doesn't matter if you're uh you know, living on the streets, you're still a human first, you're still an individual. And to when you do network, look at the person as a human um, first and see their story, understand why they are the way they are, so that you can have a better understanding of how you can maybe support them as an entrepreneur, support them with your, with your product, or even figure out how they may be able to support you. I mean, obviously, relationships and networking is always trying to build these uh, um micro win-win situations. And you can't build a win-win situation without understanding who the human is first. That's kind of the perspective that I would take on it and have taken on it. Thanks, Bryce. That's beautiful, right? We're human first, people first, um, really focusing on the individual and not maybe our heuristics or expectations. Um, that's at the heart of relationship building, right? So really ecosystems and networks are about relationships. So I appreciate the comment about being um, compassionate and caring when, when engaging people in different cultures. All right, our next question leads with, how might your organization collaborate together to support the goals of Global Entrepreneurship Week? This, I mean, this week, all week, we'll be having amazing breakouts, so please do follow. Um, Sac State has uh, graciously hosted um, in our region, so please do find out other breakouts, but uh, Jay, uh, this is an image of College Leap students. Maybe you can share a little bit about how your organization collaborates with others. You mean the the organization Muhammad and Bryce of them? Uh, it could be those or just any other organizations that you may collaborate. Just how do you collaborate? Okay, so I think what we 
are mainly collaborate with are the entrepreneurship nonprofit, like all the nonprofit advocate for an entrepreneurship in the higher education field. field. So we partner with a lot of that type of organizations in the US. And our plan is to partner with uh, the organization overseas to, to kind of bring the concept of community colleges to, the, to more students at uh, the other part of the world. That's our kind of like mission of our organization. And I think what we are trying to achieve is we are trying to use this partnership as a way to provide more networks for our students. So they, because we have our students working with us on all the projects, and then they will get to know all the connections through all these partnerships. And then as they build more connection themselves, they're able to, to work on something by themselves, right? So that's, that's the way how the, our organizational collaboration helped the students. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Bryce, how do you collaborate um, either with uh, the two gentlemen today and their organizations or other organizations? What are some real good collaboration strategies? Uh, yeah, I think um, obviously uh, I'm going to refer back to my platforms. You know, Harness Platform is a great way to collaborate um, if your organization does have a, a partnership with us. But other than that, just um, I mean, similar to the last answer is saying, you know, just just reach out and see how what synergies you may have with you know other people as individuals and other organizations. Um, I think that's honestly the, the best way. Um, I, I don't try to I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. I'm not trying to make anything too complex. Um, and I don't think our company does either. And that's just been the best way is just, you know, reach out in any way possible, whether it's, you know, email, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, and just meet new people. You're only as strong as your network. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's kind of the way that I would say it is uh, be willing to meet new people and, and see where the synergies are. Thank you. Um, so, Mohammed, how might your organization collaborate um, either across this team or um, other types of collaborations? Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff. I think uh, this is already happening and we are here because of this. We are already doing some collaborations. We are collaborating with Hannes and yeah, we're doing this today with Global Urban Nomads. So, uh, so for, for us, uh, I would just summarize it in two ways. One, we are a vision-driven or innovation hub. So as long as there is an alignment of, of what we do and what an, another organization is doing, then we can establish a partnership. So there should be an alignment of our vision. And the other thing is we are normally aiming for creating values for our members. So if a partnership will add value to what we're already doing for our members, then that's a good partnership to go for. For example, like I said before, we're not only looking for training programs, we're also looking for access to finance, access to employment programs, access to government information. And with this, that means we're building partnerships across different chains of, of, of organizations. So yeah, I would just say uh, vision or an alignment of uh, vision and value. That's excellent advice. Yeah, I think when you're working with partners, you wanna make sure that they're on the same vision, mission, I really like the values of focusing on what's important. And I think we've heard some values that are that represent entrepreneurship as a very human um, approach. So we've reached the um, last slide, which is really the opportunity to open this up to our audience to allow them to uh, share their questions, comments, and feedback. Um, what I want to do before we jump into that is I'm going to invite um, Cameron Law, who is the executive director for the Carlson Center at Sac State, to uh, maybe share a little word, a little few words about what's going on with the Global Entrepreneurship this week, as he's hosting many breakouts. And uh, um, so, Cameron, how are you doing? Thank you for bringing me in, Jeff. It's a, a pleasure to be here, and thanks for the the great conversation, panelists. It was a joy to hear, and I love uh, just the conversation around global entrepreneurship and having people around the world and and centered really about talking about collaboration and 
And really, I love the focus on humanity and that we're really all people trying to solve problems and uh, move our communities forward. But my name is Cameron Law, and I'm the interim executive director at the Carlson Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Sacramento State. And then I'm also serving as the Sacramento region's community organizer for Global Entrepreneurship Week. And just wanted to say, one, just super happy that this conversation took place this morning and that we have a variety of events taking place the rest of the week. We have um, three more sessions today. So there's a, a workshop on uh, the entrepreneur's journey. We have uh, testing business ideas with David Bland, and then we have our Sacramento region's entrepreneurial state of the union at 5 p.m. So definitely check out our website. We have over 20 plus events this week taking place all virtually, um, and these are accessible to anyone around the globe, everything from workshops to panel discussions to pitch competitions. So we look forward to, to plugging you in there. I'll share a link in the, in the chat here briefly, but appreciate you all being here and celebrating entrepreneurship and uh, look forward to the continued conversation. Well, thank you very much, Cameron. Um, appreciate your leadership. And at this time, um, I'm asking all to unmute. So you should be able to unmute yourself. And if you'd like to share question, comment, feedback, or make a connection, now's the time. Good job, gentlemen. I have a question for you. Um, for anybody who'd like to respond, what would you say the biggest barriers are to future entrepreneurs in your area? Not, I mean, aside from the mental piece, which you guys have all really, really focused on, um, what are the bigger barriers? Hmm. Uh, I mean, I, I can, I can answer that. I think. Um, I think for me at least, uh, and I mean, I guess I can only speak for you know what I've experienced. Um, I would say a big piece is uh, a, a barrier is two things: is your mental health. Uh, that that alone, I mean, that's gonna that's gonna make or break you in whether it's entrepreneurship um, or if you're working at you know uh, McDonald's or as a salesperson or, you know, as a real, whatever it is, any industry, you know, your mental health is going to be the, a huge barrier. Um, but then also along with that, um, for me, at least, you know, is that, is that idea of the imposter syndrome. Um, that's a huge barrier and somebody who grew up, you know, very low income, who's had to work since they were 12, very uneducated family. Uh, and, you know, almost got kicked out of school multiple times, had to join the military just to, you know, live um, and see, seeing where we're, where I'm at now. And not only me, but like seeing where um, I, I get to speak to a lot of lower income areas and lower income entrepreneurs. And that's something that I see a lot as a huge barrier and, and just recognizing that, um, you know, you as a human is enough um, and, you know, it's okay not to be okay and you're in your specific role and um you know the imposter syndrome is going to be there but regardless of that uh you know you'll know if you're not going to succeed right if, you, if you're going fast going hard on your endeavor you're going to know if you're not going to succeed because it's not going to have uh, any movement um but uh yeah i'd say that's a big barrier and then also everybody wants to give advice but nobody wants to um you know understand who the person is so that kind of has a, a realm in in the imposter syndrome too because because all these people who've been serial entrepreneurs want to give advice and say this is how you do it right um and that just plays into that that individual side of saying like oh man i'm not enough then or i'm since i'm not doing that i, I can't get anywhere so that's kind of my perspective on it absolutely yeah, you have to take care of yourself before you can take care of others. Yeah, I think uh, for the entrepreneurs in China, one big barrier uh, we all face is the policy instability. So like in China, like government has a lot of say in the market. So they when they announce something, let's say like they announce that they're going to invest heavily in the AI. So a lot of money going to that area. And a lot, you can see a lot of startup in that area. But when they kind of abandon some field, almost like all the startup in that field died. So, so when you when you when you are going to be an entrepreneur in China, you really need to understand the 
government policy and what the direction the government is heading. So you can pick an industry that can gain support from the government. Okay, I see a hand raised by Paul uh, De La Serta. Paul, did you wanna ask a question? Sure, uh, again, thanks uh, for, for having this, this uh, really important conversation around it. a really important topic and, and certainly something that's really, that I've really been focusing on a lot, uh, as Jeffrey, you know, um, Bryce, we've been talking a lot about this issue of, of uh, challenges that, are, that our students' population in particular in our underserved communities have. Uh, when it comes to starting up a business or just being innovators. Um, I, I just wanted to share um, and ask, ask a question as well. There, there is a, a huge gender uh, gap when it comes to um, entrepreneurship as far as success, particularly access to capital. But more importantly, you know, the, you know, around the U.S., as many of you all know who live outside the U.S., we're going through really some, some, some serious um, you know, racial inequity challenges, as well as uh, other inequity challenges that exist in our society and have been brought to the forefront uh, in regards to all, all the areas and fabric throughout our nation. And one of the things that certainly strikes true is still when you look at minorities uh, in general who um, are interested in entrepreneurship, who certainly are, have the grit and willingness to, to start up a company in their local community yet resources are scarce and support systems are, are, are scarce. Um, and not only that, the self-efficacy issues that we see are, are tremendous. When we drill down even farther into subpopulations, in particular looking at women, um, you know, that's, a, that's really interests me the most right now in the studies and research I'm doing at USC to really look at what's happening with why, why is there such still a huge gender disparity in regards to success, but not just success, but access to resources and support systems, particularly when it comes to investment capital. So maybe you can speak to how your programs are overcoming barriers for your, for the women that you work with, any particular programs that you think um, need to be enhanced or have advanced you to work towards breaking down those barriers uh, regarding gender. Yeah, may, maybe I can just throw some ideas here. Uh, in our context, like in Somalia, we are a very conservative country. We are a Muslim country. And the issues that you just mentioned are like a tiny bit of what we have here. Uh, you're just talking about like a gender gap in terms of access to, to finance and all of this, but we have a gender gap in everything. Uh, we have a mis like a misrepresentation of the religion whereby the, there is a, a misunderstanding of what religion says the role of women is and what the society believes. We also have a very conser conservative culture whereby we think the role of women should not be to come at the forefront. Uh, I think you maybe you understand what I mean. You just like kind of play off of the kind of a house, 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 housewife roles. So what we do is, uh, with all this in mind, we just want to change this. And in order to do, we design all our programs in a way that we ensure all our, our, all our applicants do get equal access to opportunities. For example, we have a 50% quota for all like female members. So irrespective of what happens to the applications, we have 50% uh, allocated for, for women entrepreneurs. And in addition to that, we have a fund portfolio, for example, of, of uh, like whereby we invest the best startups who come uh, who graduate from our programs. So in this, uh, we make sure that every year, like we give at least five startups founded by women entrepreneurs, so that we have those funds allocated to them. So sometimes, I, what I would say is, uh, maybe I don't know if uh, Bryce and Jace, uh, they don't have this like. Uh, strong ball uh, issues in their part of the world. But in our case, uh, there are very few organizations that are championing the issue of gender. And, uh, and, I ha and I'm happy to say that ours is one of them. For example, we have now been certified as a gender responsible organization by ILO. 
uh, and we did all this by adopting a whole change into the organization. For example, we reviewed our recruitment polls to make sure that we have women representation in middle level management. We, at the university level, we even have scholarships dedicated to women uh, students. Are they entrepreneur like faculty of management, like the one that uh, we are part of, the entrepreneurship programs. We have programs that accept 50% as female entrepreneurs. As for funding, we also give. Uh, so sometimes, in order to change, to make change, you need positive discrimination. You need to make, to to change the the huge gap. And in order to do that, then you need to make uh, the, those positive discriminations. And then once we have up to where we want, then we just want to make, to level the field so that everyone can play on their part. But sometimes we need to be very careful that we just don't make men themselves end up being the victim or, or by just being too aggressive. So yeah, those are the things that we do here in our office. That's amazing. Yeah, I think it goes back to the whole focus is this uh, cultural context and how it differs in the U.S. to other parts of the world. Um, you were going to say something, Paul? Yeah, no, Mohammed. Thanks so much for sharing this. It's just great to see you know those initiatives and you leading that, because I think that that really you know going on the last the last um, statement you made about not making uh, men as as the enemy, so to speak, or yeah, I'm paraphrasing what you're saying, or or the culprit of this. The reality is is that in America. Um, not to say that they're the enemy or the culprit, but they certainly are the cause, the root cause of why women are not succeeding. The root cause, because because mainly males dominate and control the venture capital of, the, of our nation. When you look at every venture capital organization, very minute portion of those are women who have control over the resources or say so and where the investment is happening. And that has to do with whether it's being invested in women or the black community or the Hispanic community you know, LGBT community, you know, into veterans, you know, that are coming out of war who are, who make great entrepreneurs, look at Bryce, you know, as a perfect example of that, right? I mean, from tremendous acumen to, to be successful, yet white men control most of the money in our nation. That's a reality. That's not a platform. That's not a political statement. It's a reality. And so, um, we found a lot of opportunity there. And I think there is a lot of opportunity to learn from what you're doing for, for instance, your, your stance on making sure that 50% of your applicants are, are women. And that's a policy statement, but it also makes a, a very global statement that, that though, as you framed, you're a conservative community, conservative, conservative in nature. There's nothing conservative about being equal. There's nothing conservative or liberal about being fair. You know, and also there's nothing conservative or liberal about making sure that inclusion is part of our programs and inclusion means that we need to go that extra mile like you guys are doing. So, um, so I really, thanks for sharing. I really, really appreciate you, you sharing that. Thanks Paul. And we're, we're at time. So we're a little bit over actually. So thank you so much everyone for participating this morning. We were actually the kickoff to the Global Entrepreneurship Week. So. I do encourage you to follow the link that Cameron lost in from the chat to identify other breakouts that you might be interested in attending. And uh, thank you again for your time. And we will have this recording posted on Sac State's website so you can learn more. Um, also, Bryce has sent his LinkedIn. So if you are wanting to connect with any of our um, presenters today, they are available to be found on LinkedIn and you can connect with them there. Thanks so much and have a great morning or evening. Thank you.